We have a great conversation coming up for you today. I'm joined by Dr. Sky Cameron. Sky is a conservation ecologist who for the past three years in her role as regional ecologist in the Kimberley has overseen the design of AWC's enormous science program working across four and a half million hectares of AWC sanctuaries as well as partnership sites. This science program is extremely ambitious, so I'd, I'd like to talk about all of that stuff. And on top of that, uh, Sky has a diverse background in conservation ecology from researching lizard evolution in Australia, uh, in Puerto Rico and New Mexico, and to the rehabilitation of big cats in the Bolivian Amazon. So incredibly diverse background and doing some great work in the Kimberley. Sky, thank you so much for joining us in this first webinar for 2023. Thanks very much, Joe. It's great to be here. Um, at first, I'd just like to acknowledge that today I'm actually um, coming to you from the traditional lands of the Ips Ipswich custodians. Um, obviously, um, not in the Kimberley um, because of the circumstances at present, but also to acknowledge that we live and work on many different traditional custodians' lands from Bunaba to Gidja to Willigan to Dumbanangadi, who some and many are our partners and just pay respects to their elders past and present and just feel very uh, fortunate to be able to work in that space with them. Thank you, Sky. It's, it's a special part of the world um, and I, I can't wait to talk about some of the work we've been doing out there. Before that, though, I'd love to hear a little bit about your background. And I know that you spent a very long time, eight years, I think, on Groot Island in the Northern Territory. What were you doing there? Yeah, so um, I was actually working for the University of Queensland running a remote research program up on Groot Island, home of the Anandilayakwa people. So working closely with the traditional owners and their ranger groups to make assessments of the small mammal populations up there, primarily the Northern Quoll, um, but also Northern Brown Bandicoots and other small mammals. Um, and then we also went into some ecotoxicology as well. So there is a large mine on the island. So undertaking research to look at the effects of that mine on the small mammal populations. Um, had a huge array of students um, and it was just a fantastic opportunity that gave me a really good grounding for the role that I'm currently doing. Fantastic. So, so you've obviously had plenty of experience doing remote work. Um, what about moving to the Kimberley? Was that a big shift? What, what were the changes involved in that move? It was a very big shift going from living in Brisbane and only doing six months, six months worth of field work up on Groot. Um, my partner and I did the journey across. It took seven days moving my whole life to the Kimberley. Um, I think it was this day today, three years ago, wow. that we started the drive. Um, and but it's been an amazing journey to be there. So I moved out to Mornington Wildlife Sanctuary um, and became part of the larger community out there and being immersed in and out on the landscape and the ecosystems that we're looking to, to manage was just a vital um, part of being able to learn and understand the conservation programs that we need to undertake to better conserve that region. Yeah, amazing. Um, I've spent time at Mornington myself. I know a lot of the people watching will have also visited that sanctuary in particular, sort of in the southern central part of the Kimberley. And you may have heard that we've recently faced a flooding disaster in the Kimberley. It's been in the news recently. Um, and unfortunately, that did have a, a really major impact on our operations base at Mornington. We'll come to that a little later. Um, one of the things that you touched on this guy was the incredible team that you lead in the Kimberley. It's often said that conservation is about people. Um, so I'd love to hear who are the people that you work with in the Kimberley and uh, you know, what do you love about that team? Yeah, that um, huge team up in the Kimberley. Um, we've got 10 ecologists, uh, full-time ecologists, including myself. Um, and we also run an internship program. For, so for six months of the year, we have budding ecologists come out and um, I guess increase their skills in the conservation landscape. But we also work alongside and very closely as a larger conservation team with conservation land managers from AWC um, who are pivotal in implementing the conservation land management programs. But then we also work very closely with our partners. So working closely with Willigan, Aboriginal Corporation, their rangers, their traditional owners, and again with Dumbin and Gardi as part of another part of our partnership on both Yampi and the Dumbin and Gardi partnership area. And the rangers and those Aboriginal corporations and traditional owners are key to the roles and the, the programs that we deliver on the ground. Hmm. 
Yeah, and like you said, a lot of the team lives remotely. So, you know, most of those 10 ecologists are based on site, either at Mornington or at Charnley or Kim Bolton up on the Yampi Sound uh, training area. Um, what's it like for the team day to day living in that kind of setting? There must be pros and cons. <laughs> Definitely a lot of pros. And even though there may be some cons to us, we all love adventure. So it's part of the adventurous lifestyle of being able to live and work remotely in a place that you care so deeply about. Um, for me, it's waking up to um, quails running underneath my house to drink at the pond or going for a walk and seeing Gordy and Finches feed on the grass. Um, and then it's also on weekends, we get to go adventuring through this amazing landscape from pack rafting down um, the rivers around Mornington and Charnley, um, and also just massive hikes. So really getting to know the region that we're aiming to conserve. Yeah. Yeah, being embedded like that is, is a really important part of AWC's model that, you know, our most of our staff are actually out on the ground, not just going to work every day, nine till five, but actually living in that landscape and getting intimately familiar with the species that they're studying and working with and monitoring. Um, and also with the cycles, you know, I, I think up in the Kimberley in particular, there's that dramatic monsoon cycle with a, a very big wet season for a few months of the year. And then, you know, six or seven months with virtually no rain, that must also pose a challenge, even when it's not a La Nina flooding year. Yeah. Um... It definitely does. I mean, from living and being out on the country, it's just showing even in the three years that I've been there, you get to see these cycles, but also the variation in the cycles and how the flora and fauna respond. Um, and that's really important to the programs we deliver. Um, and in regards to the logistical challenges, um, when it's wet season, sometimes we can be cut, up, cut off from being able to drive into town for up to four months. Um, it does mean that when we do get to drive in, it's a lot of four-wheel drive adventuring to re-access sites once the roads are open. Um, but it also provides a bit of, we create a great community. So by living out and living remote, our team is very united um, and very close as well. So it's just fantastic. The landscapes are also really diverse. Could you just describe some of the landscapes that you're working in, carrying out this incredible um, science program? Yeah, so the Kimberley, if anyone has been there or even if they haven't, as you can see from this footage, it's extremely expansive. It's very large. The whole Kimberley itself is the size of Victoria. It's 9 million hectares um, and we're involved across 4.3 million of that. Um, we have really open grassland savannas to woodlands, to riparian areas, to these deep dissected gorges, which have been carved out over millions of years by water flow, um, which then hold the permanent water of this quite arid landscape when it is in the dry season, but then becomes these extremely powerful rivers in the wet season with the inundation of water that we get during that um, monsoonal downfall. Yeah. Some of the uh, the footage that we just shared was from a uh, an ABC documentary, which has been going to air over the last couple of weeks, and it's uh, very exciting to hear that your work and AWC's work in the Kimberley will feature in the third episode, which is uh, going to be on ABC next Tuesday evening. So everyone, put that in your diaries. It's called Australia's Wild Odyssey, um, and they captured some incredible sequences of the work you're doing, but also some of the wildlife up there. What are some of the programs that you've got running at the moment? Because it, it's a very ambitious science program, isn't it? Yeah. So we've got our, our eco health program, which is our surveillance monitoring program of just making sure that everything within the systems are ticking along as we expect them to be. Um, and this is multi-species. So everything from your small rodents to all your reptiles and your bird species as well. Um, but then we have targeted surveys as well. So these are the key threatened species that persist in the area or endemic species that may be under threat from the, from the threats in the region, like cats or, or fire um, or the feral herbivores within the region. Um, and so these targeted uh, surveys are mainly on things like northern quolls, uh, golden bandicoots, um, and we even do some of the, the monitors that may be impacted from the other threats such as cane toads. 
the footage that you're seeing here is some of the work that we delivered last year on Yampi Sound training area, which is a, contra a contract that we have with Department of Defense. And we uh, delivered and undertook an inventory program. So this is the largest inventory program that's ever been undertaken on Yampi Sound. And it was across 23 sites or 23 habitat types, sorry, and multiple sites per, um, per habitat type. And from this survey alone, we're talking 15 plus ecologists and some of the footage is actually in the documentary that will be aired next week. Um, it was a huge program and took months to deliver. And from that alone, we have added more than 30 species to the Yampi Sound species list and huge range extensions for a lot of those species as well. So we've got striped-faced dunnart, which is normally more of a, a desert species to fat-tailed Sudanicinus. Um, which we only recently recorded at Mornington um, a couple of years ago. So to have a further range extension is just fantastic. Um, so that's the inventory and the surveillance and the targeted species, but we also do surveys for our key threats as well. So understanding our fire programs and how we implement them and how what the outcomes are um, against key metrics like distance to long arm burnt or how much of the area burnt, but then also cattle, so undertaking feral herbivore surveys and also weed survey. So that's all interjected together. And just that sounds a lot, but then expand that out over 4.3 million hectares, which is nearly the size of Tasmania. Wow. Yeah. Um, and you're delivering this with a team of, did you say 10 ecologists plus partner organisations? Um, and some 10 land ecologists. Managers. Yeah. And about 20 um, conservation land managers as well mm. across the region, plus so our partners, of course. That still sounds like an enormous effort to get all of that work done. Um, you know, I guess most of that has to be done in the dry season as well. Are there some surveys that you do in the wet season targeting particular things? Yeah, and most, as much as we can, we'll try and undertake surveys in the, the dry season just because it's much cooler than it is in, in the monsoon or wet season. But there are some surveys that we undertake in the wet season. For example, currently we have cameras out in the Artesian range and we're assessing the impact of toads in that region on the northern quoll population. We've been monitoring that population in the Artesian since 2016. Um, and this is kind of the, the end of that um, program to look at three years later after the toad invasion, what has happened to that quoll population. And from that, we can start having more targeted I guess, management actions from it. Do we, what can we do to make sure that quolls persist in this area? These are marsupial carnivores. People may have seen other species of quolls or heard about uh, the impact that cane toads have had. It was interesting to read that over the last year, you know, we, we tend to see a decline in this species as toads arrive in a new area. Um, and we've got the data to show that. So, we've, you know, we've been tracking the population at Mornington over many years. It must be 10 years or 15 years at least minimum um, since 2011 yeah right yeah so we we actually have fairly good data showing the impact of toads as they've moved in but there were a few sort of glimmers of hope in last year's surveys with quolls persisting in a few areas yeah so what we're seeing is that we're still getting a few individuals persisting in spider gorge um, on Cowandine and at Sir John Gorge as well. So northern quolls are still within the ecosystem. They're still persisting, but in much lower numbers. Um, what this means for their recovery, we're still unsure, um, but that's something that we're interested in investigating and then also potentially working to improve the, the I guess, the, the outcomes for those species in the central Kimberley. Um, northern quolls are... I'm not sure if you know, there's something called Semel Paris. They're the, the largest Semel Paris animal uh, in the world, which means the males die every year after a beating, after they finish breeding. Um, but the females also don't have a high survival rate. They only live for about three years. So we unfortunately had a drought that came through the central Kimberley just after the toad, toad front came through. So having those dual threats compounded really most likely drove the decline of the quolls but since then we've had two extensive wet seasons and so what I from the work that I did on group we saw huge changes in the population of our we had a really intensive long-term monitoring program and in the really boom years the population could triple in size and then in the bust years they could go down to a third of what we'd had just a year or two before so these are some natural fluctuations but that compounding effect um, has really taken a hit. But we are still seeing them persist in Artesian range 
and in the Senate Valley on Charlie River Artesian Range Sanctuary and also within our partnership sites. Yeah, that, that's somewhat hopeful. I know that, you know, there are populations of northern quolls in the rest of their range or in some other parts of their range in Queensland where there have been cane toads for decades and clearly they've declined, you know, the quolls have declined but persisted at some level, at some lower level, and in some pockets been able to perhaps recover to an extent. So I guess, you know, the important thing here is we're monitoring, so we're, we're understanding those dynamics year to year. Um, and then we're also looking at the genetic level as well. So because these populations have become locally, um, I guess, distinct, um, there's no gene flow between them as well. So by understanding their genetics, we can look at how long they've been separated for, but we can also start putting management interventions into place to try and to preserve as much as that genetic diversity, because that will be key for this species and many of this species to be able to adapt to a changing climate. Mm. You've also done some surveys recently on some of the Kimberley Islands, which are part of Dumbi Mangyari country uh, under the partnership that we have with Dumbi Mangyari Aboriginal Corporation. Can you describe to us what it's like heading off on one of these surveys? And, you know, sometimes you're in a helicopter, but this time I think you were in a boat getting out to these sites. What's that like? Yeah, it's very rare that I get to do field work. So I was very lucky to be able to go on this field survey with Larissa, who is our senior field ecologist running now Dumb Dumby Partnership. Um, Larissa and I got to join eight rangers on a boat, on two boats, and the use of a chopper to go up the Kimberley coastline to survey some already surveyed islands that hold a host of very threatened species, such as Narbalek, Golden Bandicoots, and Northern Quolt. But we also got to islands that have not been surveyed or have no history of being surveyed to Western science. Um, it was, I can't, I can't even explain what it meant to be able to be out on country with traditional custodians, getting everything from, I guess, a cultural education, but just a better understanding of the country from their perspective as well. The memory that the Dhammanagari mob hold for their country is just it's exceptional. And so we have a lot to learn from our partners in that space. And one of the key things for me was getting, doing these surveys provides access to the rangers and to the custodians who normally, as you know, the Kimberley is very inaccessible. So most of it's only via chopper. So it's providing our partners, the, I guess, the potential to re-access their country. And so I got to share a very special moment with one of the rangers who had never been to her grandmother's country. So we're well, flying around King Cascades in itself is exceptional, but then being able to land on top of the, of the waterfall and just see the emotional connection for her um, and what it meant to be able to return to the country. So while we get to do great conservation programs and have big impacts, we're also getting a lot of additional benefits from these partnerships and undertaking these programs up there. It's, it's fantastic work. And I think that the partnerships show AWC's commitment as an organisation to um, learning from and working with traditional owners across different parts of Australia. Mm -hmm. But it's more than that, isn't it? There are personal relationships that, um, which are really what these partnerships are built on. And it's, it's having people like you that spend time up there um, working with people day to day that, that really builds those partnerships at a personal level. Yeah, I think... To, to be able to, to work with the traditional custodians of Australia takes time and giving people space to build that trust and understanding of each other's perspectives as well. Um, and just being true and sitting down and having a yarn or being able to just to experience what they're going through as well. And it's taken, I mean, we're only three years in or four years for the Willigan partnership, but even in that time, feeling like you're becoming part of the, of the community. Um, and it's not just me. We've got such an amazing team in the Kimberley that are also de also devoted to not just the conservation programs, but the success of these partnerships as well. Hmm. Fantastic. There's also a biodiversity ranger program. Can you describe to us what those roles look like? Yeah. So um, a couple of years ago, we've been working with our partners and some of the rangers really wanted to get into more the ecology space but didn't have the mechanism of how to do that so we created something called a biodiversity ranger program and so this is working currently with two of the Dumbanangadi women who are just exceptional in their roles um, and just building that skill set from 
your, your planning stage from your GIS, your mapping, going out and undertaking the surveys, and then coming back and assessing the data as well and how we implement that information into the bigger programs. And they call it their healthy country plan. And so helping them understand from, from that perspective of how they can use this data to, to improve their healthy country plans. A lot of the survey work in, well, not just in the Kimberley, but across all of AWC uh, projects and, and sanctuaries and partnership areas includes the use of camera traps. So using technology to, to gather the sorts of information that you can't get through traditional trapping surveys. And your team has come up with some excellent innovative new methods for deploying camera traps to survey a whole new guild of animals that hadn't really been properly monitored before. Tell us about how you set a camera trap up a tree. <laughs> In the Kimberley from a helicopter. Yeah, <laughs> um, no, it's, it is challenging. It's not so much that the, these surveys haven't been undertaken anywhere else in Australia. It's more that we as an organisation recently had not been, uh, I guess, surveilling this key assemblage of arboreal species, so animals that live up in trees. Um, so here we've got a savanna glider or two savanna gliders. Um, this is over at Charnley. We pulled 10 sites out of these arboreal cameras and we had 100% success at each of those sites for these savanna gliders. Um, not only that, we're detecting other species that we normally wouldn't get by putting cameras on the ground. Um, so arboreal monitors or goennas, um, but also northern brush tail possums. Um, and given that they're um, listed as threatened, it's a key species to continue to be able to monitor correctly and see how they're tracking. That's one of the ones where, um, you know, listeners from down south have, uh, you know, struggle to understand how brush tail possums could be considered a threatened species, where I am in Sydney, you know, they're outside here yeah. in the west, uh, <laughs> in, in Queensland. But um, in northern Australia, they have declined. And it seems likely that that's something to do with the change in fire regimes. Um, we know that fire is one of the, the key um, components of northern Australian savanna ecosystems. And we've talked on here before a lot about AWC's prescribed burning program that we do through the Northwest. Um, but the scale of it is astounding. It's across more than that four and a half million hectares that you talked about. Um, that's been going on for a long time. Are you seeing results in, you know, the, the impact of that improving fire regime in the sorts of species and the populations that we're detecting? Yeah, um, we deliver the program now across 6.1 million hectares in partnership with our partners, so Willigan and Dumbadangadi. Um, and it's been going since in some in a smaller form as the Ecofire project since 2007. So it's a quite an extensive 15 plus year program. And over that time, we've seen a, a substantial, um, I guess, improvement in how fire behaves within the landscape. So the idea is to reduce that overall late dry season fire, um, which we have done across the huge, huge areas. Um, our partners also have carbon projects that they've been running since 2010. So we're just helping them to deliver those programs. And they've seen similar results within those areas over the last 12 years. In regards to the outcomes for the species on the ground, uh, there's a large array of evidence that suggests that combined with fire management and removal of feral herbivores, we see an increase in uh, small mammals within an area. Um, but we're also looking at different grasses and how they interact as well for um, key threatened bird species, such as the, the Gordian finch around Mornington, Marindan and Tableland. Um, but the idea is by removing those late dry, dry season fires and having those cooler early dry season fires that we're maintaining a lot of those hollows and resources that are so important for not just the arboreal species, but a lot of the other species that use them to, to nest or breed or hide or retreat. In. Mm. That's it, it's long term stuff, isn't it? Because, you know, layered on top of improving fire regimes, we've got these dramatic weather extremes where you might get a wet season like we've just had. And then it might be dry for another six or seven years with, with lower rainfall over the wet seasons. So those, I, I guess, through the data we gather, it's attempting to unpick those big spikes and, and draw out the causation. Um, exactly. Yeah. We've just done a, a research project looking at our fire program to improve our early dry season prescribed burning. 
Um, and we had 20 years worth of data and everyone thinks 20 years is a long, long-term data set, but really it's only 20 data points. So we are using that evidence, but it is conservation, especially at this landscape scale, is not just a 10 or 20, we're talking hundreds of years and it's a consistent ongoing need to, to implement these conservation programs. Here's to the next hundred years of um, <laughs> <laughs> conservation work. Yeah. Um, so from fire to flood, and I've I've touched briefly on the uh, the filming that you did with the film crew for Australia's Wild Odyssey. Another quick plug for that next Tuesday evening on ABC. I strongly recommend everyone watches. It's a, a really wonderful series, um, basically focused on the ecology of Australia but water is the connecting thread that they're using to, to tell the story of these different landscapes, different species um, and different ecosystems. Um, so that's that's all very well. That's a great story about water. Um, but in, well, just around New Year this year, there was a really big flood event at Mornington. What happened? Yeah, so um, it was a very big event. So we knew that it's at Tropical, Cool cycling alley was moving across through the Kimberley so in the week leading up to New Year's there was lots of back and forth with the team about making sure that vehicles were moved high and everything was tied down um, and then on the 2nd or the 1st of January this year the the low sat over that central Kimberley area for more than five days and within three days we received more than 800 mils on top of Diamond Gorge and that is double the amount of rain we received in 2019 in three days. Um, and because of that and where it fell, Diamond Gorge acts like a dam and that water just and across the whole array of the huge landscape of where that water fell um, started to back up. And unfortunately, the team, we had four of AWC staff and four Purple Crown Ferry Wren researchers on site and three of the team also over at Charnley River Artesian Range. Um, and we could never, ever have anticipated what the water and that that amount of water that would have fell and how it accumulated within and around the Mornington operation space. So the team were on the ground and just watching water rise higher and higher and just trying to ensure their own safety. So they tried to, they moved everything as high as they could and got whatever they could and moved to safety um, up at my house um, as the water continued to rise. Um, very, very luckily, the team who were on the ground both at Charnley and at Mornington were all safe um, and able to be evacuated after some logistical challenges because even getting a chopper out to site, we had um, our contractor who's part of our community um, do everything he could to get the team out, but it did take two days for a chopper to be able to safely get out on the ground and retrieve the team. Mm -hmm. And for the team, it's really hard. So we. I mean, this is our life. We live out there. Our homes are out there. Um, we've devoted our life to the conservation programs and to watch all of that go underwater has just been absolutely heartbreaking for, for the team. Um, yeah, it's a, a very difficult start to the year and yeah, devastating. I can't even imagine what it would be like for you and your team who live out there. This, like you said, it's your home. I know some of our viewers will have been to Mornington possibly had a meal in the restaurant. And this is, you know, a fairly shocking image, but this shows the level of the water that had backed up from Diamond Gorge, inundating all of the visitor area through the safari tents along Annie Creek. Um, all, it got much higher than that at the restaurant. So, you know, it's kind of at least two metres above ground level uh, there at the restaurant. And then, you know, the most devastating blow of all that the research centre was also flooded, um, which impacted a lot of our equipment. A lot of that was destroyed or lost. Um, and so it's, yeah, it's a huge disruption. And, you know, on behalf of AWC, but I think on behalf of all of our community of supporters as well, we're all thinking of you and wanting to do what we can to help your team get back onto the ground and important, you know, continue the important work that you're doing. Thanks, Joey. And it's just acknowledging it wasn't, it's not just AWC, it's a whole entire community of the Kimberley as well. 
Um, we were heavily impacted, our major operations were as well, but um, the amount of destructive water that went through that region um, all the way, so as you know, Derby's currently cut off. So we're working really closely with our partners who are offering, even though they're challenging and dealing with difficult times, are already offering support to help us with the cleanup. Um, the Kimberley is an amazing community. It's very people focused. Um, and while the team, and we're all still reeling from the events, um, as I mentioned earlier, we're very united um, and very close and want to, we're here because we believe in the conservation programs we're trying to deliver. So while it is a big setback, um, no data was lost. Um, unfortunately, the herbarium that took more than 20 years of Helen volunteering to collect um, has sadly been lost, but things can be rebuilt. Um, it will take time, it will take dedication, persistence, but the team are very dedicated. AWC is very dedicated. Um, and even the Kimberley region in itself is keen to get up and get going again. Yeah, that's right. We're, we're committed to getting back to work. We've also launched a fundraising appeal. So for anyone watching, if you'd like to make a contribution to help Sky and her team get back out to Mornington and continue with these critical science and conservation programs in the central Kimberley, you can go to australianwildlife.org. The link is also just been posted in the chat. So on Zoom, if you click at the bottom little chat button, the link will take you directly to our Kimberley flood appeal. Really, it, it will take a while for us to get back on our feet in the Kimberley. Um, so it'll be a challenging year ahead for all of you in the Northwest and we're thinking of you. Um, Sky, thank you so much for sharing all of this wonderful work with us and telling us about the wildlife, the landscape and the people of the Kimberley. You're welcome. Thank you, Joey. And thanks for everyone for listening. Thanks, Sky. To everyone who has supported us, thank you. All of our work is funded by your generosity. If you've been inspired by hearing about the work that we do in the Northwest, um, but you know, similar to work that we do across Australia, I'd encourage you to make a donation. You can do that at australianwildlife.org. Don't forget to catch Australia's Wild Odyssey on ABC TV next Tuesday night, featuring Sky, um, catching bandicoots, catching quolls, and doing all of this incredible work. That's Australia's Wild Odyssey, um, ABC, next Tuesday evening, and it's also available to watch on iView by streaming. Thank you, everyone. I hope to see you next month for our next webinar, and I'll talk to you then.